Hi folks, welcome to Better Boston Arts, the interview series asking experts how the Boston art scene can rebuild after the coronavirus pandemic. I'm Dig Boston Executive Editor Jason Premis, and today I'm talking to Boston-based artist Sumeya Ali. Hi Sumeya, thanks for coming on the show. Hi Jason, it's so great to be here and to be able to discuss Boston and art, two things I'm totally in love with. <laughs> awesome, well that's nice to hear. It's like <laughs> Boston does get a bit trying at times. Especially it so does, lately. it gets so trash too. <laughs> So like, um, you know, we always start off by, or we, I always start off by asking, um, you know, folks in this series, like, you know, like who they are, who are you, Sumeya Ali? Like, what's up? Tell us all about yourself then. Yeah, I'm Sumeya, so what that means. I guess like, there's so many ways you could answer that, but for sake of time, I'm a black Muslim Somali artist. So I came here when I, um, I was born in Kenya. So I came here oh. when I was about five years old. So I have that immigrant background that also does influence a lot of my art. Um, I've also been assimilating to American culture, but in a way that's not so like, like negative, I guess you could say. I've like, what that means is like, I've been adopting like Boston culture and like what it means to be like a black Muslim woman in Boston, an artist that's also young. That's like, like so many, like my experience and my perspective is like very unique, I would say besides like the general, like when you think of like a Boston artist, you're probably thinking of like a fancy gallery. So in conclusion, I'm a black Muslim. <laughs> you don't have I'm to conclude. Black... Okay, cool, because I will ramble. So. No, you can ramble yeah. I and mean, we got at least an hour, it's cool. I mean, um, I mean, let's even talk about the Somali immigrant community for a second. It's, I, I, because I've been an immigrant advocate for a long, long time. And I, I had Somali friends at UMass Boston about 15 years mm -hmm. ago and, you know, still in touch. But the community has grown in the last quarter century, but it's not huge, right? Yeah. So in Boston, it's definitely, um, like, I can mention other cities in the U.S. that have a larger Somali presence. Like, Minnesota's the first one that comes to mind, mm. as well as, like, um, San Diego on the West Coast. So in Boston, we're not, there's not too many of us. And I feel like, I don't know, at least me, I kind of just mind my business. But they're, like, the ones that um, do connect do have, like, a good presence. Like, we know each other. So in that sense, like, we're aware if there's, like, an increase in Somali population, like, if there's a new family that comes into town, like, for the most part, like, we do our best to, like, welcome them. And, like, I'm also, like, involved with um, organizations like Acedon, who kind of, like, um, help make that, like, transition from, like, one country to another, like, a lot smoother for people. And what's Acedon? Like, why don't you tell folks? Right, right. So um, Acedon is the African Community Economic Development of New England. So it's they're a nonprofit org that's based in Boston. So they primarily assist um, East African refugees in New England with um, literally anything from like parent teacher conferences at like your child's school to like um, getting like housing or like legal help. So it's basically just like a really community support thing. Cool. Um, there's another organization like that that I also work with. So they both have this program that mm -hmm. I can like talk a bit about. It's called Yup. So it's the Youth Ubuntu Project. So I've started on um, leading their arts activism course. So I worked with them before once in the summer as an intern. And once I returned, I was like, hey, I have this set of skills and this way that I've been like looking at things because I'm also a sociology major. Nice. So for me, thank you. So for me, um, what I've been doing is like combining my like very like social justice, like social theories, like side of my life with like my artistic creative side of my life and just kind of seeing like where those two can intersect and seeing like what comes from that. So that's been like my arts and activism workshop that I've done with um, ACEDON and CSIO, which is the other organization. They're called the Center to Support Immigrant Organizing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I know so, yeah. them. But, yeah, they're... Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think um, I was curious about um, how you got into the arts. I mean, did you have groups like this ready to help you? you know, when you were younger? Yeah, so I'm super lucky. Um, it's so funny, because I was just like in high school. I was like at the John D. O'Brien. Mm -hmm. And we had an office that would help like youth find jobs. So that school was like very career and college based. So I'd like tried my best to take advantage of that, because why not? Right. Um, yeah, so, but at the time, a lot of my friends were doing like health science based things, which made sense, because it is a school of math and science. So I was like, damn, I'm not really sure that's what I want to do. I don't think I want to, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I well, sociology has some math depending on, you know, what kind of quantitative research you do, but yeah, word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Like, I liked, 
math that like had a purpose i would say like people yeah. are gonna drive me for this but whatever like i i personally could not be in medical school for a long time um it just wasn't where my heart was and a lot of the time like i told myself that i could but i found this organization called um artists for humanity and what they did they're like the largest employer of like youth in the city of boston yep. so they hire youth like in their high school career and they give them like creative jobs so i everyone starts out in the phoenix studio so that's where i started out but for the first three months, I was, like, so trash. Like, I was so, so bad. <laughs> so I was like, damn, maybe I just kind of suck at this. Well, had so you been I, into art before that? I mean, like, how old are we talking here, first of all? Like, were you 15? So, like, okay. yeah, so I was, like, 15, 16. It was, like, yeah. January 2016 is when I started. Wow. But I was into art younger as, like, because I was, like, into, like, manga and, like, comics. So I right. would draw like that. But, like, it wasn't, like, painting. Like, what they did at, like, Artists for Humanity is, like, um, you had professional mentors, and they had, like, a degree in fine arts. So you were getting, like, real deal arts, you know what I mean? So it was very challenging. I do and, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a degree. Like, I have an MFA, so, yeah, in, in visual arts. So, yeah. Like, yeah. Yep. So the structure and the techniques are, like, very, like, they're not easy to, well, they are easy to pick up as long as, like, you're willing to apply yourself. Mm -hmm. But at that time, I thought that it would come naturally to me. So I was like, let me back up. So you had to work. Like, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I was like, oh, never mind. Maybe I'm not a painter. Mm -hmm. So then I went to the video studio. I, like, kind of asked them to, like, transfer me to the video studio. And I explored a bit of, like, film editing and, like, um, video production, <laughs> which was also great. But then I was like, I don't like this either. Because mm -hmm. at the time, we were doing, like, a lot of um, client work. Like, we'd be editing for people. So what I missed was like the creative, like independence that uh, that painting would bring me. So I just like asked them to switch me back, and mm -hmm. they were probably tired of me like switching. <laughs> so much, but but I finished it out in the painting studio, and it was great. I bet they're proud of you now. You know. They, because... mm -hmm, thank you. They've been so supportive. That's like the thing as well. It's like um, like I still go back to like the artist humanity like building as well, and like connect with the people that I've met there as well. That's so a cool that's kind building. of what I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah, it's so cool, right? Yeah. And um and then you so then you you're in Simmons right that's where you went mm -hmm. after that, yeah. um and what's that been like I mean because to me I read it and it's funny because I have an intern coming in from Simmons, who mm -hmm. writes for the Voice you know uh, for next semester and um, what's her name? Uh, her name is Maya Friedrich. Oh, I don't think I know her. Yeah, mm -hmm. she seems cool and I mean so, but I mean I I'm I'm aware that Simmons is like um, typic the typical Simmons person has struck me as an upper middle class white suburbanite right. Uh, mostly women, because it used to be a women's college, I think, yeah, mm -hmm. and now it's more co-ed, uh, but it's very, very expensive, you know, so, so um, I get the feeling they're spreading some money around, you know, but um, what's it been like there for you? Yeah, so right now it's like um, women-centered, like they've switched their language to be more inclusive of like all gender identities, which is great, um, so, and their graduate is co-ed, so it's like, only graduate. graduate, okay. Mm -hmm. Only graduate is COVID. So my experience there, I had like the worst anxiety the first month I started there. Can mm -hmm. I lie to you? Because I oh, was no, not. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, because like you said, like they're all middle white suburbanite people. I don't know any people like that in my life. Like mm -hmm. a lot of my friends and family are like all black and brown, yeah. very diverse. Um, I do have white friends, I guess you could say, but they're not very like upper class. Like that's not right. really a community that I engage with very much. So for me it was like very stark like those differences and just like um like class difference like behavioral difference i'm a sociology major so i will like name you that. know what's up yeah yeah exactly so that's the thing like i was that's also when i um because i started in as like undeclared i applied for like their political like master like political science or whatever and i'm so glad i got rejected because i would have been like a political policy like political science major i was a phd yeah. student in public policy at umass boston before which mm -hmm. i left and i hear you on that yeah very much with the minor yeah. in economics so it's like could you imagine i again <laughs> yes yes i can yeah so i'm like so <laughs> glad that like that program didn't work for me so mm. i came in undeclared as a major and i took a um, sociology class intro to social and a lot of the times like it was very helpful for me because i was able to like understand why I felt so I had a place at Simmons and why only in certain areas like we had a multicultural center which is a room so a lot of like the, um exactly so a lot in the center but that's really a room <laughs> it's funny it kind of just like speaks to like how Simmons will also like treat their black and brown students like they won't really um 
Like, not to drag them, but they deserve to be dragged. Cause... No, no, do it. It's a lot of, I mean, these microaggressions pile up until they become exactly. macroaggressions, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's like, it was a lot of microaggressions. So something as like, putting you in the basement and, like, yeah. of the campus. And, like, so that center was meant to be for, like, marginalized identities, for, like, the people that feel like they're a minority in the community. Hmm. So that doesn't only apply to racial and ethnic identities, but a lot of the time that's what ended up happening. That would be the only place that like black and brown students on campus would like do their thing, like hang out in. So that's what that is. Like they put effort in, but like obviously like there could be more that's done. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. That's not like just like Simmons. It's just like the larger, you know. Like yeah. It's very similar, I think, at a lot of other Boston colleges. Mm -hmm. You know, um, sure. I think UMass Boston is better because the student body is just so much more diverse and there's so many mm -hmm. more kids from Boston. Well, it's not just kids. So many more people from Boston, you know. But I, I don't want to give them too many props because there's a lot messed up over there, yeah, starting with the fact the that it's too mm -hmm. expensive and it shouldn't cost anything. Anyway. Yeah, Simmons is also really expensive. And I don't think, like, I don't know if I'm wrong. So, like, I don't know. Don't get mad. Whoever's going to get mad if I'm wrong. But um, I don't think their tuition like increased, like it should have decreased once we went virtual, but it just right. stayed the same. So it's like, it's really <clears> curious. <throat> it makes you think about like what they're prioritizing, like all universities like in America. And it's obviously like wealth, you know? Well, I write about this stuff and I mean, I, you know, apparently we have similar academic backgrounds. So I mean, my take on it is basically that um, so-called private colleges and universities like Simmons are not private the vast majority of their money comes from the public. And in Massachusetts, we have such a preponderance of these so-called private schools that they literally steal money out of the mouths of everyone in the public school, public university and college programs. So mm -hmm. like, you know, and I've done the math on this stuff, you know, when you, when you just look at Harvard alone, it takes a significant chunk of the money from the feds that should be going oh, like to the funding? system. Through all kinds of stuff. Through, through I mean, mm -hmm. you have to think about, um, uh, how student loans are done and of course why there are student loans. Why don't we have a K through 20 education system or a lifetime education system like Denmark where it's just something that taxes pay for and everybody does it. There's no nonsense. Like you go through K through 12 public mm -hmm. school and now even pre-K in Boston. And so why not, why not the rest of it? Why do yeah. we suddenly stop the opportunity, right? And there are a lot of, mm -hmm. well, so I'm just saying like places like Simmons want to survive. And they, they are on the edge despite the huge, and by the way, their tuition's like something on the order. And tuition and fees are like four times as much as UMass Boston. Yeah. As bad as UMass Boston is, it's nowhere near close. And Simmons. it's such a small school. That's right. Well, they, so they're on the edge of, of doom, you know, at all times, they, they, especially <laughs> schools that don't have a huge endowment. They're not Harvard, right? So they, <laughs> if, they, if they were to cut your tuition and fees during the pandemic, they're done. That's, that's, yeah. I'm, I haven't looked at the numbers for Simmons, I'm willing to bet and we could we could ask, you know, like that's mm -hmm. why, you know. Yeah. And I think like to prove your point as well, like they've allowed um so they just recently allowed students back on campus for the spring semester. Mm -hmm. So before it would only be like necessary. So students would have like social work placements and stuff like that. But now they've um allowed like students like anyone who wants to can apply. The thing is they've done it like they've decreased it by fifty percent. Mm. But I don't know. I'm like skeptical. So I'm like, are you doing that because you actually care about students who need housing, or are you doing it because like you're trying to like you know like <laughs> save your ass essentially? A little from column A, yeah. a little from column B, probably. Mm -hmm. You know, it's but definitely a mixture, and that's like the tricky part. Like now, it's just like like every like I guess like especially during the pandemic, like people are just kind of like doing their best to like make the best out of the situation, and it sucks that like there are players in the game who like try to like manipulate you and try to prioritize that. I mean, not prioritize, like capitalize on that. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's always the way. And mm -hmm. academia is filled with a lot of unpleasant personalities and a lot of sort of social and cultural minefields for every thinking person, I think. Uh, certainly a lot we could do to reform that system. But today we're going to focus on I'm talking sorry. about <laughs> the arts. No, no, yeah. I want to talk, believe me, I would be perfectly happy to get on again and do another yeah. show just about you know, with you and others about higher ed and, you know, you as a student, mm -hmm. other people as professors, other people as staff, you know, but we'll, we'll go to the art thing, the art tip. So, um, yeah, um, th the question I've been asking everybody just to get, get into that part of the conversation, um, and please, you know, go back to your own, your own life, your family life, whatever you want, your school life, whenever you feel like it, of course. But 
the question I'm asking everybody the opener is sort of like, um, <laughs> and this is a big one, right? I mean, what problems did you see in the Boston area art scene, or as some of our interviewees have, st- have talked about, like um, art scenes, you know, like parts of the art scene or different scenes that you've been involved in? Like, what problems did you see that, that you know, you really want to kind of highlight in this discussion, mm-hmm. you know, that need remediation, that are messed up, you know, like by, by any metric? So what, what yeah. stuff was bothering you before the pandemic got, mm-hmm. got going? Yeah, for me, what was bothering me was that there wasn't a lot of spaces that were like community arts based. A lot of the times um, when you look at like arts in Boston, it's more like you have like galleries and then you have like a few select like, organizations like AFH or like a few select like, community like recreational centers or whatever. But there aren't really places that like give people that direct art access to like fine arts, especially like painting, like um yeah painting (laughs) that's it because i'm a painter so like painting or like other mediums or like ceramics and stuff like that Mm -hmm. there are studios and like maker studios all throughout the city of boston like soa the distillery like these are artist spaces but the thing is it's like you have to be like a 30 40 year old like established artist with money to rent out a space with resources and whatnot so i'm just like wondering like what would the city look like if we actually like made um those resources like if you had a space that you could go into and you have canvases you have paintbrushes you have paint you have people ready to like instruct you and to guide you and to just kind of like make it so easy for you to just like be creative because i really think um that's like a lot of what we're lacking right now is like well not what we're lacking but i really think like especially now since a lot of people are at home and like Mm. apparently we have more time more downtime or whatever depends yeah yeah exactly depends so what i've been doing is i've actually been kind of disregarding my academic work which i shouldn't but it's just i can't focus on that right now right so for me luckily i have art so i can like play with that i can distract myself with that but i don't know if everyone has that so i'm like what would it be if i could go to this art center and i could go paint when i just need to like get out of my head or like get out of like the very real situations that are like going on in my life like a pandemic i mean before the pandemic there are already real situations that you observed right in the art scene Mm -hmm. right and what what were some of those situations Mm -hmm. like specific situations that bothered you i mean stuff that bothered you specifically Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so i think like what would bother me is like me going into a gallery and then like the gallery owner who's usually like an upper class white person like looks at me funny and I'm like I'm like what's up like why are you looking at me like that um other things that bothered me like I remember in my because I also took an art class at Simmons mm. and, and like the instructor was like so condescending and a lot of the times I couldn't understand why and I was like literally so for me it's like a lot of the times like my so I have like a sociological background and there's like we study like black feminist theory and there's like the whole idea of intersectionality which is based on black feminist theory so me being not only black but also black and muslim i think like that really spooks some people because they're like i know how to like digest muslims i know how to digest black people i know how to digest women but like that combination is just like what do i do with this person that's kind of like straight ignorance isn't it because from the beginning islam has been multiracial you know? Exactly. Like from the moment it like, started, it was not like something that happened later. It was right away. Mm-hmm. And even in, even in America, like Black Muslim people have been here since like like fourteen hundreds. You know, like it's nothing new. Mm-hmm. But it was like like yeah. Anyways, um, but a lot of the times, like they just kind of don't know what to expect from me, which is like you shouldn't have expectations for anyone. Honestly, you know, everyone's so you different. You can't really assume. So the professors would just like be really condescending to me. I remember one time I told her like, oh, hey, I like forgot to stretch my canvas or something. Um, can I just do it in class? Oh, no, I remember now. It was like, oh, this student was like a white student. She didn't have a canvas. I didn't have a canvas. The white student got a canvas. I didn't get a canvas. Ouch. So it's like, yeah, in situations like that, it's like, like, and then I like I see what it is. Like clearly I'm able to identify it. And in those moments, I'm like, oh, like, what is this? Do you think that, like, I don't deserve to be here, like, in an art class? Like, do you think that I'm not able to, like, improve my artistic skills? So a lot of the times it's, like, other people will, like, doubt that, like, black and brown people 
can make art that like young black and brown artists can be like so talented and skilled you know but i mean you know it's like <laughs> on the structural side of things it, it obviously didn't occur to these teachers or or gallery mm -hmm. owners like um you know you're you're not going to be like one of the well-off like kids necessarily right yeah. that got to go to like mm -hmm. art camp every summer for like their whole life and you know had mm -hmm. every advantage and is automatically accepted based on skin privilege cast you know into these mm -hmm. rarefied Almost spaces there. be they classrooms in university or galleries which are you know and let's be fair white 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 you know like it's um even yeah, now class as well mm -hmm. that's right yeah so i mean um um i mean i'm you know I'm, I'm setting this up structurally too you know because of course when i'm asking you later in the conversation you know what do we do about it it's like on the one hand like what do you do about it well like what would you do about it what what did you do with individuals acting mm -hmm. within these racist structures and classist structures what did how did you handle that those situations yeah. Mm -hmm. So the way that I would have handled a situation like that, like, let's say even two years ago, is very different than how I would handle it now, because I've learned a lot more about um, self-determination. And like, what I mean by that is like, kind of, again, like black feminist theory, there's like a tenet where you like, sh the whole basis of black feminist theory is to like shift the power dynamics that exist within a relationship. So in a situation where like I'm having a gallery owner like disrespect me or like even um, like someone tell me like that my art isn't to their standard, I just shift the standard. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not creating this for you, I'm creating it for myself and for people who are like willing to see my art for what it is. So I think like just honestly like just doing my thing and kind of like not looking to them for approval, even though it gets so difficult because sometimes like like obviously they're able to like make those more concrete decisions that affect you well yeah. they're gatekeepers so i mean exactly you, know, so you either deal with them or you go to a, you build your own gate yeah Basically, so i've right? been building my own gate so a lot of people like will try to deal with them and i think like that's like we both need people to like break down the gates and also build other gates um some of the ways that like i've seen those gates being broken down is like through like nonprofits like AFH that hire like a lot of more um a lot more youth. So it's like literally giving them an the opportunity like that. Also just I don't know. Like in colleges, I'm not so sure if at this college like you're the one making the decision to take an art class. So like you're already probably considering like the costs and stuff like that that go into it. So what they can do in those instances is like um have the art supplies like ready for students. Because I remember that was another issue as well. I was like so shocked with like how expensive things were. Like yeah. I knew they already were like going in. Like I know how much paint costs, but like we had things that like, like a medium that we literally used once. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what is the point of this? You know? So just like, they should definitely um, advise like instructors and like art educators and like gallery owners in general, like anyone who has like an art degree and art background, like, like we need to have like more of a diverse, like um, exploration of art. I haven't taken any art classes like on the fine art degree track, but I can assume that a lot of it is like European Western centered. So I wonder like- Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, I was gonna ask you, is there, is mm -hmm. there have, like maybe, maybe not, you don't know this yet, but are there other, I mean, I know a little bit, you know, just from having studied and talked to people and I'm older than you and whatever, but like, um, have you, are you aware of like Somali art traditions, for example, mm -hmm. you know, that you can right. point to like right away and be like, well, you don't know about this, but this is how folks do stuff over here, you know, mm -hmm. that, or, or do you still need to study up on that stuff? Yeah, so I can see like culturally, because I do painting, so I haven't really like against Somali painters. I see like modern Somali artists like through the internet and whatnot, but I don't know how much traditional background they have. But traditionally, like the arts has been like, um, like basket weaving and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So it's like, right. it's really like, it's more hands-on and it's like, you know, so I'm like, I would love to study that more, but you know, because Simmons doesn't think that's important, I don't have a class on that. Right. And I mean, it's, <laughs> there's, I think a lot of places don't have classes on that kind of stuff. Like the Museum mm -hmm. of Fine Arts, for example, does indeed have baskets from different African cultures and other mm -hmm. kinds of artwork from different African cultures and cultures all over the world. But that's not what's 
valorized in terms of its ongoing art acquisitions yeah. and its mm -hmm. ongoing contemporary exhibits, certainly. It's not like countries like Somalia went away. They yeah. had a lot of struggles, a lot of it, war in the case of Somalia, but stuff still happens. There's still, you know, what, mm -hmm. what we kind of condescendingly call craps going on that to, to yeah. other people are art, right? So like, you know, um, this is something that's come up before in this series, you know, the idea of like, well, what is art anyway? <laughs> like, right? I mean, I, I don't, what's, do you have a personal answer for that? Yeah, that's what I've been considering a lot too. Cause like, but for me, it's more so like, and I don't know, cause I'm like, I look at something that I've done and I'm like, technically that's art. Like I see a sketch, I'm like, yeah, that's art. But to me, it's a sketch because it's not a fully developed painting or a fully formed out painting. So then I'm like, what's the difference between that? So then to me, art becomes this like thing that like, like it has multi, like it's a process, I guess you would say, like it would be based on an emotion. So like, or a message, like having a meaning, something that like, like there's a reason for it to exist. And you also have to be like intentional in the way that like, you're a plot, like for me, at least this is my process. Hmm. Like when I, like if I, someone says like, show me your art, I'll show them a painting. And usually this painting comes from like this process that I've gone through. So um, like I said, like having an emotion, a meaning, like an attention behind it, as well as like the more technical aspects. So like, how am I using the color? Like how am I layering? Um, are there other artists I've seen before, like traditional Greek artists that like, <coughs> I can um, use as a reference, like for my paintings, to really make it like up there, like at least um, visually. So yeah. I don't think like there's some people who will take like something like The Simpsons and then, then like just like make them black or brown or like give them an afro and then they'll be like, that's art. I don't know. I don't think that's art. That's <laughs> like it's like I have more of a fine arts background, and even then you can get into what that is. Like there's a bit of elitism that comes with that. So yes. It's, like, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's definitely like, like take that with a bit of salt or whatever people say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, everybody has a different answer, right, for this. And in, in this, in the last, I don't know, 50-ish years or whatever, the idea of what art is has opened up a great deal, you know. Um, you know, whatever criticisms, criticisms I might have philosophically of postmodernism and post-structuralism, one thing that came as part of that whole discussion in philosophy and in the social sciences and stuff was like, hey, you know, don't trip about like what art is. Like, don't get all wrapped up in this. I mean, everybody approaches this differently, right? Mm -hmm. um, however, that's not the people that you're running into when, when you and uh, other young people like you run into the big white art world, you know, like, or, the, <laughs> or the narrow white art world, is people that have a rigid view, Yeah, I think. Exactly. And I don't like, I don't blame them for having that view. Like, cause there's a reason that view exists. Like there's a reason I go into a museum and I like literally tear up staring at a painting, you know, like there's a reason that like that, um, that exploration in art is so critical. Like there's a reason that like artists like have such a like stick up their ass about like what they think is good. Like a lot of artists are like super self-critical, like even me, like I, <laughs> like my, I'm like, yeah, it's good. But like, it's been a minute since like I've looked at a painting of mine and I'm like, oh, that's so crazy, you know? So like I do have those moments and like that obviously comes with like other reasons I feel like that. Like it's not only because of my skill, it's also because of like what I've absorbed and like comparing myself to others. So yeah, I think like, um, as I'm saying like that, like that exists for a reason. And I don't think it's all the way bad. I think the issue arises when we don't let other people start criticizing it. Like, if we um, just hold on to, like, one form of what we think art is, then, like, it doesn't really allow us to, like, shift it. But it's, like, tricky because you don't want to, like, allow everything in. Like, you want to make is, sure, like, it is. It's cautious. Like, mm -hmm. You know, it's being open to all kinds of interpretations of art, you know, can take everything away from the best art, however people want to figure that, mm -hmm. being an excellence a thing that one works really hard at and strives to get plus some innate talent, whatever that right. is. Right. Um, you know, occasionally throws up some work that 
is almost universally understood to be mm -hmm. a great thing, you know, but um, when you're just kind of accepting every perspective on art as, as essentially the same, you know, like having mm -hmm. the same value, things can get muddy. I mean, may, you know, some people don't agree that you can say that one work a human does, you know, to sort of communicate information about life on this planet as a human at that particular moment. Um, you know, they won't accept that, that one work is better than another. Mm -hmm. But for me, and you know, I'm, I'm probably like where you're going, which is like, I, there's very little art that I like. I, it, all my, I have a, I, you know, been to art school. I have all kinds of friends that are artists. Yeah, and that's my, my closest friends have heard this from me. Sorry, I just don't like most stuff. You know that. And that's I see. okay. Like yeah, you, you, know. you have your reasons. I bet. I do. I mean, but I mm -hmm. like people. You know, so like I'm not looking like certain. Like I'm, I, uh, I function as the arts editor of Dig Boston, right? Our newspaper, because um, I have the background and whatever, and we don't have a big staff. You know, so we all have more than one hat. All the, you know, the, the, the top three folks, you know, Chris Ferrone, John Loftus, and myself. So, you know, um, I'm very not into trashing people, you know, like I, I'm not like gonna, gonna use my bully pulpit with this newspaper to be like, you suck, <laughs> you know, get off the right. stage, you know, like I, that's, that's not of interest to me. You know, I'm interested in what different communities, different people are interested in. And that's mm -hmm. enough. Like, so we report on it. I don't need to trash them. Why, why would I need to trash them? Now, if you want to like get into a discussion and debate about the relative merits of work, yeah, I'm totally up for that. It's just that I'm doing other stuff and, you know, and I think that there are ways to have those conversations like, you know, the Art Institute, Art Institute of Boston where I, I got my MFA. I thought the MFA program I was in, the low residency program, had a good vibe about it. Like they were not, you know what a crit is, right? You've been in the mm -hmm. art world long enough, you know, you, you critique each other's works, right? Yeah. Or professors come in and crit or teachers or famous artists or not famous or whoever. They're critiquing mm -hmm. your work, you critique their work, whatever. Um, we didn't do most of the time the vicious, you know, like destructive crits, right? But there are schools like CalArts that are famous or infamous or Yale, you know, for like mm -hmm. having really vicious crits, you know, like especially at the MFA level, like 36-hour crit sessions, and people are like losing their shit, you know. And like, I'm like, why would you do that? I don't know, you know. The thing is, is like, I would want to do that though. That's right, and that's why yeah. those programs they exist for a reason. That for exactly. some people, this is going to bring out the best in them. For other people, it's going to put them in an insane asylum for a while. A little little vacation mm -hmm. is going to be necessary. Right. And I didn't go to, into my program. You know, I got into art very late in life, you know, like when I was in my 40s. Right. Became a photographer. And I was like, oh, you know, I, I didn't get a terminal degree in policy and stuff like. But I want one. I like to be a teacher. I want to be a professor. And then like, oh, MFA. One of my friends said, why don't you try that? That's a terminal degree. It's like a Ph.D. in the arts. I'm like, oh, OK. So like I wasn't looking for I, I was never expecting that I was going to be like. Mr. Super Artist, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, that was my thing, but your thing, yeah, you know. Right. Yeah, there's, like, definitely different roles for people, and I think that's also what I'm discovering as, like, I um, venture out into the art world more, like, independently. Because before, like, I had the MAFH community to, like, guide me, to be like, here, apply to this grant, apply to, like, this show, whatever. That's right. But now important. it's more like I'm, like, literally, like, looking from my own stuff. Like, a lot of the times, like, I guess you can say I'm my own art manager where I'm like searching for opportunities, searching for grants, applying to grants, getting rejected, applying again, <clears throat> paying I don't get rejected, looking for other shows, um, like binge watching <clears throat> YouTube videos to like teach art skill. So yeah. I think that's why people like me are allowed to say like that's not art because like we've identified it enough, like or at least like to ourselves, which is what it comes back to is like perspective. Because mm. you can look at the same painting in a museum, and obviously that painting is good because it's here, it's in a museum, you know, if we're looking at it through that perspective of good. But I can just walk away from it, and I can be like, no, that's so ugly. Or, like, someone else can be like, oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> but then it's like, why is it here then, you know? Like, what were the reasons that, like, this painting, like, um, is universally accepted, like you said? 
So this is great. You're ready to break down the doors of these big white institutions. <laughs> and, you know, we'll certainly at Dig Boston do our best to back up you and other young people like you in the arts. But, okay, so back to the structural thing. Mm -hmm. What were the barriers, you know, prior to the pandemic and, of course, now uh, for you and everyone around you at Artists for Humanity and also at Simmons and, you know, like, what, mm -hmm. the, I mean, because you mentioned money in your writing and you've, you've already mentioned it a little bit today, like you mentioned applying for grants. Like, so yeah. is there money littering the streets for young artists to just like get better and get out there? I mean, or not? Technically there is, like there's definitely, like, so I made a painting called, um, it was one of my paintings that I made summer 2018 and like, I don't have it with me right now, so I can't show you, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you can like see it on my website, but, um, Oh, excuse me. So that painting has like an old Somali transcript that's not used anymore. It's oh. called Osmania. And what I did was I took the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and I translated it into Osmania and I like wrote on the painting like that. Wow. So, yeah, thank you. So then, yeah. funnily enough, there's a poster contest for the Universal Human Rights Declaration. Um, Declaration of Human Rights. Like, there's like 200th anniversary or something like that so they were celebrating that and I was like wait this is like perfect let me just go apply so then a situation like that like where I ended up getting like first place in the art contest and as well as like a nice thank you <laughs> as well as like a nice little check like I was like what in high school at the time like hmm. things like that could mean a lot to like young artists and things like that like just continue to like propel you forward so I think like yeah, there is like money laying out in the streets, like for young artists and opportunities. But a lot of the time, it's self advocacy. But beyond that, like even before that, it's like knowing you have the right <coughs> to self advocate. But is all the talent out in the streets connected to this money, such as it is? Like, you, you know, well, you're in Boston. Artists for Humanities here, famous program, big program. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, would you say that other talented people in the arts where you were growing up in Boston um, mm -hmm. were all plugged into this or not? Um, I don't think so, to be completely honest, because my perspective is very limited in the sense that like the people I was creating with around my age was through the AFH community. Yep. So like, unfortunately, like there wasn't many folks that I knew outside of that that had access to that, which is what I'm saying. Like Boston needs to have more spaces like that because it shouldn't yes. be fair that there's like only one space in South Boston. Right. And I remember like my friends telling me like, <laughs> we travel like literally an hour just to get here. And I'm like, only to pay for three hours a day. And I'm like, damn, I would not be doing that. Mm -hmm. But I understand why they do that. Because like, it's having that creative space, like you literally feel so different once you're allowed to just like go into yourself and express. And at O'Brien, were you allowed as well? So we didn't really have an arts program mm -hmm. until like literally my senior year. Like, they had, like, music and stuff like that, but they didn't have, like, visual arts. And I my senior year, they literally had an art class. And I was like, I was like, hmm, funny. Funny that as I'm leaving, you had this. But it was great, though, because um, now, like, if you go into the high school, there's, like, art all over the walls. Oh. Like, student-made art. So I'm That's like, nice. Yeah, it feels really nice. Yeah, and a lot of people that go into professions like health sciences and stuff also have artistic stuff that they do. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of doctors or musicians for example, like right. it's something that you see. Um, and nobody's just like one thing, right? So I find that healthy. I mean, that's why I'm glad you're getting the sociology background. One criticism mm -hmm. I had of undergrad arts programs mm -hmm. um, when I was a professor and stuff, especially, were that they were not giving people a good liberal arts education necessarily, right? And I think it's hard to be a good artist if you're not educated. You know, like it's, right. I mean, it's like, what are you, doing? you know, I mean, obviously people are out there doing cool stuff that don't mm -hmm. have training and certainly like in our newspaper we want to give those folks attention too but in general terms like you know if you're going to have something to say about the world you need yeah. to like see what's out there right so you know exactly. that's part of the thing well you know yeah okay i'm glad you brought up the the lack of community spaces and money this keeps coming up over and over again right. that's I, why I'm i noticed to, that and it's not this is not by design like i didn't pick people that i all thought were going to say like this or that thing like people are coming now to me and saying, oh, can I do this? You know, like you did, right? So mm -hmm. they're coming from whatever perspective they're coming from. And I, you know, I suppose they have some agreement with what I'm doing, you know, with the series. Um, okay. But they can say what they want to say. 
So this is something that other people, people are seeing, you know, is, is a problem. Like the space thing is a big one, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I, I, I talked about with Yaritza Menivar uh, in that interview was, was this thing, you know, that bugs me, especially with young people of color, where once you hit 18, the programs stop. Yeah, they kick you out. <laughs> yeah. And then where are the follow-up programs, mm -hmm. right? You went yeah. to college. Maybe everybody out of that program didn't go to college, or at least not right. right away, you know. Or they went to like Roxbury Community College, you know, and then they like um, have to work even more than most other kids have to work when they go to school, and they just go to school very part time. Yeah. So it's going to take them a lot longer, you know. And, and then you like don't even have time to do art because you're yeah. like, you come home from school, you come home from work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and having started doing this stuff midlife, I, I understand what that's like, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I could have been a photographer earlier. I got a camera with a Sears card, you know, like in the 80s and a film camera. And and then uh, I owed roommates some money and they were not very nice roommates. They were kind of roughnecks and they, they just um, uh, stole my camera and pawned it for the rent money. So then I didn't have a camera. So that was <laughs> that was it for photography for me until much later you know, 20 years that later, really basically. Sucks, yeah. <laughs> it's like, not that I couldn't have borrowed a camera, but like I hadn't even had a chance to shoot with it and see if I was into it and like, you know. Yeah. So I was just like, oh, maybe that's just not something I was meant to do, you know, whatever. Yeah, life is too fast. Yeah. So like, um, okay, well then let's, let's talk about the second big question, you know, that I have for people, which is like, okay, there are, there are these different problems structural racism, individual racism, structural classism, sexism, heterosexism, whatever, and all the individual versions of that. Um, and then specific issues which relate to the structural problems, like <laughs> there are all these expensive condos being built. There are all these fancy office buildings being built. You know, there's some public stuff being built, but these days it's mostly public, private, so-called. Like, you know, we can't have like public housing anymore. It's got to be public private housing. I'm, I, I'm not sure what that means, but I don't think it's yeah, good. Yeah, it's literally you know? not tomorrow. And so, you know, um, where, but in all of this, and I'll ask you why you think this is important, but like, where is all the art spaces? I mean, you're already asking that question. Where are the art spaces? Where are the art spaces? Where are the art spaces? So pandemic is turning everything upside down in mostly bad ways. But, you know, it's not a terrible thing for society to have to think about what's up with it. So sure. what do you think after the pandemic ends in probably a couple of years, you know, like young artists like yourself, older artists like me, all the different kinds of artists and our allies <clears throat> can do to improve um, these problems that, that you've mentioned, other people have mentioned, you know, mm -hmm. in the Boston think... area art scene. Yeah, so I think like like you said, um, I don't know what it was you said, but it was something along the lines of like um, people are now realizing that like they need to get things together, like we need to get shit together as a result of the pandemic. At least mm -hmm. that's how I'm interpreting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And things in general. So I think like now that um, we're literally like at least before we were on lockdown and like there wasn't much going on, so a lot of people were just being observant. Mm -hmm. and the world was just doing its thing it was continuing so then we started realizing like wow these like things kind of suck for example there was still police brutality yep. and i remember somebody asking like how are we not even allowed outside and police are still killing black people it's like how is that happening it's a pandemic so anyways my point is is that like we can take this now as a time to actually like ask ourselves like what does our world look like after which is what you're asking and the way that like the role that at least artists play, I think is, or at least like what I should say is that we should really allow like other creative people. But the thing with that even, I'm like thinking in my head, sorry, that's on my sense. No, go right ahead. Copy. You can think out loud and you can stop yeah. for a minute, whatever. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is, is like one, we need to allow like creative people and artists like to lead that post pandemic or like whatever, you know, and two, anyone can be an artist that's my other thing so it's like when i say like we need to let artists do that i'm saying we need to let anyone who feels like they have a story to tell who feels passionately <clears throat> enough to create a visual art piece about it we need to like let them have that access because i've mentioned before like um 
like one a lot of art is gate kept like there's a lot of gatekeeping in art so there's not an opportunity for you to even try it to see if you like it and two i've been leading that arts activism curriculum so what that is it's like 20 20 to 30 high school youth and we were able to like give them like painting uh-huh. supplies we were able to like bring it to their house during the pandemic so i'm wondering like what that would have looked like if we were actually like physically together because like even during the um a lot of the like during the summer program it was all virtual so a lot of the lessons are like me doing virtual demos like in my room like this hmm. so i'm wondering like okay once we're allowed like once everyone is safe and healthy enough again to like go outside and to meet in like large groups like can we like look to the city of boston to like support us and be like here is paint here are paintbrushes like you know what i mean take this and like teach these young people how to creatively explore their world, how to like be creative thinkers and like, because I think like people don't understand that like artists are also very critical thinkers or at least like the ones I'm well aware of or the ones that I consider artists are. Yeah. Like if you think of like if you look at like Rothko and like Basquiat, like you can see that like their social identity like also influence like what they're thinking about and how they're interpreting the world. They're just doing it through a different lens. So like we have all these young people right now that are like literally exploring their world and i don't want them to just like do it through like just one very narrow perspective if you get what i mean Uh, so like why and i've asked other people this too um Mm -hmm. why do you think our communities you know and society in general should support the arts and artists you know like what uh, Mm -hmm. what's your answer to that one you know, um, cause you're doing arts activism, right? And that you can also yeah. answer, you could also like tell us what you think arts activism is. I mean, that's part of the answer. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. I think it's like literally like art, like it's the one thing that's going to like last the longest. And I, it's also the one thing that has the most potential to change and save the world. Like not to sound super idealistic, but like you have to be to make one change to happen. Like it's kind of like that idea of like, um, overshooting so at least like you reach something so i think a lot of artists tend to like see the world and like very or at least we see it in critical ways so like i'm gonna speak to myself i don't want to generalize so for me like as an artist like what i do is um or like, i guess i should generalize because you're asking why should we support that's fine you do both <laughs> you can do both because i fit into the general picture hmm. but the bottom line is it's like like we create art for a reason and like those reasons are often like because we feel things deeply because like we have this like vision that like really other people don't even artists artists that vision can be so differently and it's visions like that that really like capture like the attention of like um folks on a larger scale enough to actually make like a shift in our structures in our um like in our very real world even like beyond like the structural things like that so like very much affect us like just in our emotional, like in our very, like, like if you think to yourself as like an independent person, like on that very like inner self, like art can change you on that level. So I imagine like what would happen if we were able to like discuss it or able to engage with it in a larger level. Yeah. Like there's this um exhibit that I'm thinking of and it was like a traveling exhibit and it was called Coexist. And mm. it was this really mm. cool book. So they got like, have you heard of it? I think I have, yeah. Yeah, it was so amazing. Like, it was all over the world. Like, right. Asian. Mm-hmm. So, and the whole purpose of it was to, like, allow people to understand what it means, like, to coexist. So I think of, like, um, movements like that, that are very, like, artistic and creative, and how, like, a visual language is something that we can all share. You know what I mean? Yeah. hmm Yeah, that's a good answer. I mean, I think... <clears throat> um, I do think artists people that do it, whether they call themselves artists or not, you know, but Mm -hmm. do it a lot, have an extra gear. (laughs) I kind of know how else to describe it. It's like a car with a sixth, fifth or sixth gear, depending on which car we're talking about. Something, yeah. Yeah, something. (laughs) And like um, that, being able to take, you know, very broad and very fine views of society and of stuff around us and kind of interpret it in different ways, I do think can help other people, you know, to navigate, you know, to like think about what's going on in their lives and in the world and think about the possibilities of change. And art sometimes can literally reflect people's vision for change, 
which can mm-hmm. be nice, you know, yeah. so that people go, oh, there's another way to think about this. Like, oh, I don't have to be a racist. <laughs> you know, how about that? You know, like there's actually no no logical reason to be a racist. Like it's mm-hmm. a stupid, stupid thing, you know, for example, or more prosaically like, oh, you know, we don't have to have very, very rich people and very, very poor people. You know, that we, we could we could share more. Yeah. That'd be nice, you know, stuff like that. And I mean, when I talk about the arts in the series, I mean, I'm talking very broadly, including writing and mm-hmm. film and, you know, music, although I've mostly been interviewing visual artists because that's you know, kind of my side of this stuff. Um, although I mm-hmm. was a musician when I was a kid and an actor when I was a kid and stuff like that. But, but um um, but I do think of this broadly. And of course, there are all different kinds of ways that these ideas can be brought across to people. In the case of visual arts, it is the visual language you speak of. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, um, you know, do you have any like political thoughts about stuff that people could do, you know, artists and allies to like, let's say, get more space? I mean, is there anything that you're connected to that's already working on this stuff? Or, mm-hmm. If not, it's cool. I'm just curious, you know, if you think about this yeah. stuff like that. I don't know, not as much as I like want to be like, I'm sure there are organizations doing that already, as I found time and time again, when I think of stuff like there's probably already people doing it, or there's probably already people doing something similar that you can join in and add your extra, your extra skills to. So um, I know there's like, for example, I know Dorchester Art Project, they do, um, right, so they're They're friends of ours, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So it's like, you're familiar with them. And Mm -hmm. what they're doing is great. Like, um, they do their best to like, like prioritize like Dorchester area artists, which a lot of the time are black and brown artists, as well as like providing um, like studio spaces that like reduce costs to like help people like mitigate that like barrier yeah. financial costs. So yeah, there's like <clears throat> those community spaces. I mean, but, they're very into the mutual aid thing. I'm sorry, go ahead. Right, exactly. That's exactly what I was gonna say. I was gonna mm-hmm. say like, I'm big on mutual aid. Like one of the things I did was um, I donated like a portion of the sales I made for my prints to Dorchester um, Community Fridge, which is an example of mutual aid, you know, like you're directly helping out your community. So I think people should definitely like look into that more, try to like educate themselves on what mutual aid is. And what I will say Mm -hmm. that it is not is that it's not charity. A lot of people will view it as charity. Hmm. It's not. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, because everyone's involved. It's a, it's exactly, a two-way, everyone's involved. It's a multi-way street. Everybody has mm-hmm. something to give. And that's important. I think, you know, we also need political campaigns, um, you know, for the arts and stuff. I mean, and th- that there are groups, you know, like the Mass Artist Leaders Council and others that do different pieces of this. Um, I, you know, I was involved in an attempt to start a group, you know, Mass Creative Workers that was going to be sort of like a union for artists, which we have had in the Boston area in the past. You know, although I don't think it was super diverse in the 70s. You know, I think it was diverse across class, but it was mostly, I don't know. We'd have to get some, hopefully I'll run into people that were involved in it um, and get them on this series so we could talk about it a little yeah, bit. Really but cool. I, my sense of it from the records I've seen of it, you know, is that it was mostly white. You know, I think today it would not be, you know. Mm-hmm. But by the same token, you know, significant programs of, of artists of color um, that were once supported because of the struggles of the past, like, I always think of, and I had Shea Justice as my first, you know, interview subject here, you know, people that are part of the uh, uh, African-American uh, Master Artists in Residence program at Northeastern. That program's been pulled apart now. You know, Northeastern's just shoved it aside, you know, and yeah. once it had, if I understand correctly, uh, back in the day, it had its own building, you know, it had a lot of people involved with it, you know, and it was a direct result of community struggle in the 60s and 70s, you know, to open up space. Mm -hmm. I don't see that so much right now. I see a lot of retreat, a lot of like people like I'd like to see young artists hear more about this stuff. Right. You know, like so that they're like just like artists open up possibilities for people in general. Well, you know, older, more experienced artists can open up possibilities for younger artists like, hey, we tried this and we got so far with it and then we got pushed back. So now you all can like try to carry the ball further you know um yeah although it's not like (laughs) older artists just go away and are going to stop doing stuff but you know what i'm saying i mean yeah for sure a lot of the folks in that particular program are are up there you know 60s Mm -hmm. 70s you know Uh, um, i think mm -hmm. i was gonna say like i think what you're speaking to is like having that continuation of like seeing like upward 
progress like for artists like for example yeah. me as a young artist right now like I would love to know more about like what that struggle looked like for example at Northeastern like getting that building up getting that master's program up for artists especially African-American artists because we definitely need things like that now and I think like especially now things are like so kind of shaky and wobbly yeah that like we can like make enough noise for someone to be like all right we, we understand where you're coming from and we'll give you that space because there's a lot of like ambiguity about what's going on so i agree with you 100 hmm. yeah. percent. cool um and i guess just to finish up um i don't know is there any any um groups out there you want to boost any you know signal boost anything that 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 uh, viewers should know about uh that yeah, you're into sure. or, what? um wow that's like <laughs> i have so many that i can think of but now they're all just like out of my mind we can I'm do it like, in text we can add it to the text to the okay, video awesome. and stuff too it's not or yeah, end yeah. of the article and um um how are you enjoying the current political situation on the big on the at the national level like <laughs> are you opt optimistic at all i mean because i'm not i'd like to hear if somebody is but i simply dissociate i'm kidding i don't dissociate sometimes i do when i need to i don't it gets blame a you overwhelming. <laughs> it gets a bit much because i'm like because, like, the bottom line is that, like, for a lot of people, especially for a lot of, like, incredibly marginalized people, like, so even, like, people who are, like, um, housing insecure, like, homeless people, like, much doesn't change no matter, like, who's president, you know what I mean? So it's, That's like, right. it gets scary to think about because it's, like, so much can change, but also so little can change. I'm, like, concerned. I'm not very optimistic, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping that people are able to, like, get it together before shit gets like too crazy you know what i mean yeah i mean one of my um uh wife's siblings uh girlfriends uh asked me uh in portuguese you know she and i don't really speak i speak a little i, I know a few words from my wife and stuff but you know she asked me like you know oh who's gonna be the new president and i just said um capitalista a, a capitalist like exactly. i don't it what you know like okay it's Trump was really nasty guy, whatever, but you know, presidents going back all the way pretty much were mostly not so great for regular, regular people, Yeah, you know, and, um, the broad working class, people of color and, you know, like immigrants, like, you know, Obama was not so great for immigrants, you know, like, um, you know, it was great to have a black president finally, but you know, black president in the service of corporations, you know, and so yeah. now, Anyway, I'm not. I'm, I was asking yeah. you. I'm answering, but I, but yeah. yeah no, I get it, and you're like resembling a lot of my thoughts. So it's like I don't know about all that because I'm more of like a grassroots person. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, my my South African friend who I've interviewed for other stuff. Um, uh, we, he's been here a long time, but Seren Mudliar, um, always. There's I I think it's an African saying that we walk on two legs when he's talking about mm -hmm. political things, and someone says, well, we have to do this kind of individual level thing at the grassroots and then someone else says no we have to do these grand global things and he'll say like well we got to walk on you, you know we can yeah, walk on both. two legs you know we can do yeah. both you know and different people can do different things to different degrees you know exactly. and they're all important so so anyway Samay Ali thank you so much for coming on thank today. you this is um, so great yeah mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sure we'll talk again in the future and just stay on for a second I'm going to turn off oh. the uh, video stream but I'll you know we'll just we'll just chat for a second after we get up. So thanks, Hogan. Bye, folks. Bye. Thank you for watching the show. Bye. <laughs>